Hey Carissa, great to have you here today. Uh, when I have a chat with you, I always learn something and I'm really interested about your history, what you're doing now and especially where you're going. So I'll just start with a quick intro and then we'll get into it. Uh, Crowned LinkedIn top voice in technology, co-founder of the TMFE Group, which is constructed of several businesses related to cybersecurity, a cybersecurity investigation journalist. You create podcasts which enhance leadership and you interview celebrity practitioners around the world. Wow, I mean, that's a great deal. Can you tell me a little about how you got there and what you're doing now? Well, I've got 15 years of corporate experience and I would say probably about 12 of those I've spent in information technology and probably 10 of those I've spent in cybersecurity. So I am a cybersecurity practitioner by trade and then I started to move into what I'm doing now. Although I didn't sort of wake up with this idea, it's been more of a natural progression and evolution towards what the industry needed. And so I also enjoy talking to people. I enjoy interviewing them. I enjoy getting out there in the field amongst the industry right around the globe. So for me, I feel like it makes sense to marry up a lot of the strengths and the curiosity that I had for cybersecurity. So in terms of timestamps, security practitioner by trade, did a number of other things in terms of consulting, etc. I was an analyst. I've done a range of different roles in the industry. And then probably around 2017, I started to become curious around what it would look like to run a business. So I quit my job, started to do rudimentary reconnaissance in the space around what was missing. And I'd say two parts of that were one piece is, hey, I run a cybersecurity company or I'm a vendor. How do I you know, run marketing and get deals and sales? Part of that was a content agency that we still own today, which is the backbone of the media brand, uh, specializing in cybersecurity companies. And then over time, we started to see a gap around the awareness piece. So we wanted to bring a level of modernity to the industry that we believed was missing. And so to fast forward, basically, I'm the founder of a global cybersecurity media company. And as you said, David, I interview so many people. Some of those are quite very large company names, you know, people. And for me, we're going to continue to do this. Uh, but equally, it also gives me quite an in-depth understanding of the space. Wow. And with that history and looking at cybersecurity now and what you do, mm -hmm. what I see is cybersecurity is moving so fast. A lot of times it's underappreciated. It's not really understood that well at many different levels. Mm. What do you think is missing through most organizations that may be key, but we're just not seeing it? In terms of cybersecurity, do you mean? Or? Yeah, it's cybersecurity and really making sure that uh, it's articulated and we can make a difference with cybersecurity, like good practices. I think there's a couple of things that I would say that, again, when we're in cybersecurity, we focus so much on the business understanding what we do. But in my experience of working in this space, it's quite apparent that cybersecurity people don't really understand how their business makes money. And so with that, it leaves a gap, a gap in knowledge that if you don't understand any business makes money, how could you protect it in a way at, that makes sense. So I would say that's a key one that I see. I think the other thing is, is losing vision around why we're doing cybersecurity. I mean, you're not there to just practice cybersecurity all day, right? You're there to protect an organization, people's data, people's information, money if you work in a bank, etc. And so I think that at times people forget that that is the core vision of what cybersecurity practitioners do right around the globe. So for me, I often fall into that as well because you can't see sometimes the day-to-day -day stuff that you're doing, but knowing that it does make a difference long-term, that's something that I do see missing. And then I'd probably say the third thing would be how we talk about it. Again, this is a really interesting field. However, some people and how they explain it can come across a little dry and a little boring. And as a result of that, people just start to tune out. And when they tune out, it means that they don't pay attention. When they don't pay attention, it means that stuff starts to go wrong. People start to click on links. They start to perhaps oversee red flags, etc. Yeah, I agree. And we see that a lot as well here in New Zealand and in Australia where they make it functional. You know, some people do that. And so it's not really integrated well. People don't really get any energy from it. It's just something else they have to do. And where I come from, I see that kind of as a risk as well, because if it's not fully integrated or it's not a habit where you don't really get behind it, then mm. it's not getting the appreciation it deserves. So mm -hmm. just on that and the interviewing around the world that you have done, are there mm. any uh, key stories or anything really interesting from the people you have sat down with? Yeah, so many people ask me that question. I would say that all of my guests have been amazing. Each of them have brought in a 
different perspective, a different opinion. I selfishly learn through just my own show in terms of asking some of the best people in the field in the world and ask them hard questions. So I would say that, look, they all bring something different. It's a big space. There's still a lot of areas that I need to explore. There's always going to be something to uncover. I find that interesting. I'm a really curious person. I want to get an answer and people know that when they do an interview with me that I won't stop until I get that answer. But equally, I think that asking the hard questions is really, again, what the industry lacks and it's what it needs. It is. And without those hard questions, we can't really drill down, find out what's going on, fix the right problems. And it's, it's some sometimes too much on the surface and again kind of becomes a function mm. so with everything you're doing and, and the people you're speaking to and the obvious drive you have what's next for you and what would you like to achieve say in the next few years or in the future you're right i am quite an ambitious person because i'm not one of those people that's like hey i want to like sit back on a beach and drink a cocktail I find that fun for a day and then i get bored i want to do something so for me i'm definitely very entrepreneurial. And so I never, I never actually think here's the ceiling and this is where I'm going to stop. So for me, I would say I want to be able to do what I do now better on a bigger scale and globally because there is so much opportunity out there. And as you would know, being in, you know, in this part of the world, Australia, New Zealand, you sort of feel at times a little bit relegated from the rest of the world. So I want to be able to do this on a bigger scale to be able to demonstrate that I am capable of being there with some of the other people at that level as well. Awesome. There's such a, a big world out there and there's such a need for good cybersecurity and people actually articulating it properly so people understand. That kind of brings me into speaking. So when you're speaking to organizations, teams, whoever it might be, what's the approach you like to use and, and what do you like to, to get out of that speaking? For me, it's always about being very honest. I have old school, old fashioned traditional values. I come from a small town originally, so maybe that's been engendered to me as a child, but I'm always very honest with how I speak to people that I'm dealing with and always telling people like, hey, you may need this and not that. And I think that's refreshing for people out there. I think people are sick of the, the corporate speak. And so for me, that is my point of difference. And yeah. I think people respect that and they honor that. And that really gets through, especially with that being genuine. The experience is, is a huge thing. It's not just templated or it's not just copied from something else. And it really gets the, the message there. So for all the cybersecurity people out there and the people who might be associated or kind of connected in some way, is there any advice or any tips or anything you'd like to share for them? Well, I think it's a field that you've always got to be learning. I think that when I say to even students or people that want to get into the space, like, hey, if you don't enjoy learning, like you probably shouldn't be in it. We don't want complacency in this space because when people get complacent, it means they miss things. When they miss things, we have issues. So for me, I would say you want to be able to diversify your learning then as well. And I know that sounds sort of counter intuitive because I run a media company. But again, you want to understand like what is it that people are saying, whether it's on social media, podcasts, at events, newsletters, vendors as well, they still have a very big place to play in this arena. So I would say that you need to diversify how you are consuming all that information and then understand, you know, what, what's going to resonate for you. So there are some people that, or for a podcast, for example, that you may enjoy than others, double down on those people. So it's about learning more and investigating you know, what else is out there that they can draw from and improve that way. Yeah, and I would think that probably that stems from if you look at behavior and how people are consuming content nowadays, people want to do it on demand, they want to do it in their own time, they don't yeah. necessarily need to be spoken to by someone, they want to be able to digest it in a way that makes sense to them. For me, I'm an audio person because at the end of the day, I'm super tired, my eyes are tired, I don't want to read, don't want to watch something, but I can listen to it as I lay down and eventually go to sleep. So Again, that's sort of a habit that we are seeing even in the media space as well on how people are consuming that information. And so then we are finding different ways to communicate to those people in order to cut through with the messaging, whether it's short form videos as well, I find quite effective for people. And when they're doing that investigation and they're learning more and they want to know about the industry so they can improve, when we're coming into AI, what kind of effect or impact do you think this really fast charge of AI might have on cybersecurity going forward? So it is a double-edged sword. As we all know, with AI, it means that we can combat threats faster, but equally cybersecurity criminals are attacking us faster. What I would say though, which is really fundamental to me, especially for probably the younger generation coming through that are going to be protecting our organizations at the coalface would be lack of critical thinking. So back in the day, like 
you know, I'm not that old, but when I am speaking to people who are a Gen Zer, they are a little bit perplexed by some of the uh, language that I'm using. One of which would be even like a refidex. There was no growing up, there was no, you know, iPhone to direct you where to go. So I think that you had to instinctually learn how to get places. And I think that that also draws a parallel to how we think in organizations. So if we were, if ChatGPT went down or the internet went down, would people be able to get us through some of these incidents? The challenge I think what's gonna, we're going to start to see is people won't have that critical thinking capability. They won't be able to fall back on their instincts. And that to me is something that I do see interesting and I'm curious to see on how that plays out. So people might not have those basics. They rely too heavily on something else to, to do it for them or give direction. And then they mm. won't have experience base or, or even got a mentorship to, to actually meet that if something does go wrong. I think so. Now, I'm not talking about like millennials or you know Gen X or anything like that talking about the new generation, because we need to pay attention to those folks because they are going to be the people that are protecting, you know, our children and our children's children and those companies and so forth. So I don't think we should forget about them, but I do see it as these, some of these folks are heavily reliant on it. And that does create a problem to be like, do you trust yourself to be able to navigate through something if something were to happen? And when we're talking about if something were to happen and from your experience and what we're kind of touching on now with cybercrime, mm -hmm and it's growing, but I'm no expert on how much it's growing. How much do you think, or what would the impact be, do you think, on what we're talking about now, about where AI is going, with maybe the experience of people in cybersecurity and their capability? What could happen as, cyber, if, as cybersecurity kind of starts getting worse? Look, I think it's going to get worse. I think that, again, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't have all the predictions. What I can tell you is that even the last 12 months, things have accelerated. I think people have burnt out. I think that people are just trying to catch up with even the basics of cybersecurity. They haven't even done that. And yet we're adding complexity with AI. I also think that we are entering into uncharted waters and that scares people a little bit. And rightly so, because again, there's no blueprint. There's no something that we can follow. There's no manual for this. So we're still trying to figure out and learn. I don't believe we've seen the full effects of this. It will be catastrophic, especially when you get into stuff like critical infrastructure, national security that we rely on day to day. And I'm, I've interviewed people that really can discuss that how quickly an incident happens specifically to critical infrastructure, how our society starts to unfold and how people start to just lose their minds and manic and chaos starts to, starts to be injected. And I think that that's something that does scare me. But again, I also don't like to lead with fear, uncertainty and doubt. I, I'm of the opinion that people need to be realistic and understand what their next move is and be aware of the potential issues that could arise. But I don't want to... I don't want to keep, I don't want to scare people, but again, I think having that fundamental understanding is key for people to make strategic decisions moving forward. That's interesting. And, and just on that point, and what we mm. see a lot here, really two countries, but what we see a lot here in organizations is that we might think we're prepared for something like a cybersecurity attack or a crisis, but we don't practice it enough. So we might have something mm. sitting on the shelf or something that we've got templated or we say works and then a year later two years later something happens but we don't go near it because maybe we haven't practiced it enough or we don't trust it so we reinvent the whole wheel kind of what you're touching on uh, again mm. so do you think there should be more practice some more habit in organizations and with individuals to actually be ready for these kind of crises as they come up through through doing that yeah this is an interesting one and this is something that i really press people on because everyone's like you know practice it get a plan or an irp or whatever and that's fine, but I always like to think about it if, if you're on an aeroplane and how many aeroplanes you've been on, they do the same old thing, this is what you've got to do. But if there actually was an incident in an aeroplane, how confident would you be to be able to act in that situation? Why? You tune out majority of the time, people are still on their phones and they're thinking about what they've got to do next. So therefore, yeah, they sort of see high level what's going on, but you know, could they do it when there actually was an incident? The other thing would be that panic starts to set in. Oh, the way in which your brain reacts is significantly different to when you're just going about your day. So that's something that I also see as, well, how would people react if there was a whole plane, potential plane crash that was on, you know, on the horizon? How would you manage that? So I think it's really hard 
for people to to get in those scenarios where those feelings and that intensity and that stress is there. I have heard of companies out there that are trying to reenact a lot of those same feelings and situations, but it's never going to be like the real thing. So unfortunately, until people are going through multiple of these breaches and incidents, I don't think you're ever going to be ready. Yes, I believe you should be prepared. I think it would be naive of me to say that people are 100%, 110% fully prepared and we're ready for it. I think there's still a lot of unknowns and there's no, every breach is different. We can't be like, okay, well, I went through the last breach. It's going to be the exact same. Chances are it's not going to be. There's going to be nuanced little things that come up that perhaps you couldn't foresee. Yeah, and that, that really brings home that don't get too reliant on something that might have happened before or something you practiced or something that you've written out of procedure. It could be totally out the window by the time something happens. So you have to really get that thinking in check and be able to pivot really quickly. And that sounds like where cybersecurity readiness is, is, is kind of going. Mm. So that's a to me, it's a fascinating background and I'm sure everyone listening really likes what you're what you're talking about because it really does ring true on so many different levels that everyone's experienced. Just as a last question, are there any <laughs> final thoughts or any kind of thing you'd like to, to give the audience before we end? I would say that cybersecurity is a fascinating field. I genuinely love it. And I also would encourage people that, you know, if you're not working in the field, you have a you have a place. We want people of different pedigree to be able to come into the space to be able to combat cybercrime. Cyber criminals don't have a structured way of learning and then neither should we. We don't need to have everyone cut from the same cloth. We need to have a variance of background to be able to combat that as a, as a unit as well, not independently. So I don't believe it's a zero-sum game. If I win, doesn't mean someone else loses and vice versa. I think we can work together, again, with the same vision to collectively fight these cyber criminals that exist. I agree. It makes makes so much sense, especially with uh, everything changing rapidly. I just want to say a huge thank you, Krista, for being here today. I really enjoyed uh, listening to you, and especially from your experience. It's very deep, very wide, and I can see it's where we need to start going if we're not starting already to tackle and kind of compete with cybersecurity. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Really appreciate it. Okay. And I'll talk, talk to you next time. Wonderful. Okay. I'll speak to you soon. See you, David. Bye-bye. Take care.